G'day, it's Pete here and I'm back for another featured lesson and today what I wanted to talk about are the objectives in Bridge. So what are we actually trying to achieve when we're playing Bridge? Because people often get some sort of fuzzy thinking and like, oh I have to show my partner this or this is what I have to do, which is completely the wrong way to try and approach the game. You want to have an objective and then you want to work towards achieving this objective and firstly that objective is easy. I want a better score. I want, if we're, if we're playing match points, I want to take more match points. If we're playing imps, I want to get more imps. How do I do that? And telling my partner about my hand or things like that might or might not help it, but rather than focusing on that, think, I want to get this, I want to achieve this, how do I actually do this? Now, today I'm going to be talking mainly about bidding objectives, what are we trying to achieve in the bidding, but I just wanted to start it off with one hand uh, about play. So let's jump in and let's say that uh, for whatever reason our side had a complete mix up and we got to three no trumps by south and we got a diamond lead. And the first thing that you see is we have a nine card spade fit. Everyone else is going to be playing in spades. Okay, so let's now talk about our objectives. So how should we play this hand if we're playing match points? And how should we play this hand if we're playing imps? So if you want, try and pause the video now and work out how would I play this hand if I was playing imp scoring or if I was playing match point scoring and what are my objectives because this is a very important thing to sort of think about. Okay so we're playing uh, in three no trumps and if we're playing imps let's count our losers. We have a spade loser, we have a club loser and we've got two diamond losers. If we were playing in four spades we would be able to rough our diamond loser and make 10 tricks. So what I like to do in these things is work out what contract am I in and what's the normal contract. So as I just did there is I made a quick analysis of how many losers I had and is four spades going to make and the answer is yes. You're going to be making four spades. So we're in three no trumps and we can realize that four spades is going to make. It's got uh, two diamond losers but you'll be able to rough one you've got a club loser and you have a spade loser and everyone's just going to take the spade finesse and if that works they have no spade losers and they're going to test to see if hearts break 3-3 and if hearts do break 3-3 they'll be able to throw their club away so uh, the range of tricks that people are going to take in in four spades is between 10 tricks if the spade finesse fails and the hearts don't break to 12 tricks if the spade finesse works and the hearts do break because they'll only lose one diamond. Okay, so now that we're actually in three no trumps, how should we try and play this? So the opponents have led a diamond and what we want to do is count our winners and we've got a diamond, a club and three hearts and a spade. So we've got six tricks at the moment and we need more and it looks like we should take the spade finesse. But let, let, let's work out what our range of tricks are and what can happen. So we're in three no trumps and let's say that the spade finesse works. Okay, good. We're now up to five spade tricks, three hearts, a club and a diamond. And what if hearts break as well? What if hearts break three three? Okay, we've got five spades, four hearts, a club and a diamond. So our range of tricks are actually at most 11. So if everything works, we make 11 and everyone else in the normal contract makes 12. Okay, so how's that going to affect our score? Well, we're going to get a bad score. Uh, we're, we're not going to score much at all if that's the case. Uh, what about if the spade finesse doesn't fail? Well, we might not even make our contract. So. I've let a diamond and we might get, um, we might lose four diamond tricks and a spade. So we might go down one. So we, our range of tricks are between eight tricks and 11, whereas people in four spades are ranging from 10 to 12. 
And what you can see is if we play this hand the exact same way that people that play uh, four spades will play it, then we're going to get a bad score. Uh, we'll, we don't know how many other people mess this hand up, but definitely the vast majority of people will be playing in four spades on this hand. And so we might get 10% if we're lucky. Okay, so what do we want to do on this hand to try and fix it? Is we want to work out how can we make as many tricks as the people that are in four spades make. Okay. And one way is to not take the spade finesse. If we play a spade to the ace and hope for a singleton king of spades, this is a very unlikely event. Well, it's an unlikely event for a singleton king of spades. But what we know is if we don't do anything, we're going to get a bad score. And our objective is not to try and take the most amount of tricks we can in three no trumps. It's to realize what the norm, what everyone else is doing, and then how do we get a good score seeing as we're actually in here. So if we instead try and drop a singleton king of spades, when it fails, we're going to get 0%. We're going to get an absolutely terrible score. We'll, like Our best possible case was we are getting 10%. And in this case, we're going to get 0 But any time it does work, we're going to get 100%. Because we're going to be taking... If we drop the singleton king of spades, we're now taking as many tricks as the people in uh, four spades. Uh, we can't rough our diamonds still, but we get that extra spade trick. So we would be getting 100% whenever that works and 0% whenever it fails. So to actually get a good score in this, we should play in such a way where we try and uh, work out what the normal contract is realize that we're not in it and then try and compare okay four spades is a great spot this is how many tricks it can take this is how many tricks I can take if I take the normal line so let's try and do something abnormal so on this hand what I would do is I would win and I'd lead the queen of spades because sometimes the queen of spades will get covered and when it doesn't I'll play the ace and hope that the king drops now when it drops we take our five spade tricks our two uh, minus two aces and at least three hearts for ten and if hearts break we make eleven and everyone that was in four spades that took the spade finesse which is the best percentage chance will lose a spade and they'll lose a diamond if hearts break and if hearts don't break they get ten tricks so we have now equalized it and we've got as many tricks as them so this is a kind of good way of thinking about hands when you've had a bit of a mess up and realize that you're not in the normal spot and you can think, I want to get a good score. How do I get a good score? It's not just about taking the amount of tricks that you need to take. Like, trying to make three no trumps will not get you a good score on this hand. So you may as well try and get a good score. So how do you do that is try and drop the stiff king on this hand. So that was just a little bit about the objectives in the play. Most of the time, when you're in the normal spot, you don't need to do that sort of thing. But you have to uh, work out... Um, how do I get a good score anyway? And plan the play appropriately, which usually involves taking as many tricks as you can or making sure that your contract is cold. If um, I was in playing imps on this hand, my objectives would be a bit different. So I wouldn't try and drop the stiff king. My idea is that we made a mistake. Four spades is better, and I'm happy to lose an imp or so. That's not the end of the world. So here I would want to try and make my contract, so um, I would take the most likely chance, which is taking the spade finesse. Um, but in match points, that's not a good choice. Okay, um, so next I wanted to talk about some other objectives in bridge, and mainly focus on bidding in bridge. So what are our objectives when we're trying to bid hands? So the, the two usual indications that we want to try and do to work out where we want to get into the bidding is how high do we want to get and we use how many points we have basically and to judge that and we also want to know uh, what should be the trump suit and to do this we want to know do we have a fit which is an eight card eight cards eight cards between it or do we have a playable spot at least like you don't always need eight cards you can play with seven trumps if you're getting less than that it's not really a playable spot 
Um, so in the bidding, we want to work out how high we want to go and find a playable trump suit. So to do that, we want to work out how many points we have and uh, how many trumps we have, what's our fits uh, situation. But there are, there are other things to do in the bidding, which is that doesn't give you a perfect answer. We want to find out more information and estimate what specific cards partner has and things like that and to knuckle it down. But we, what we don't want to do is there's a fine balance in this is that we don't want to tell partner absolutely everything about our hand. And the reason for this is everything we tell our partner, we also tell our opponent. So what we actually want to do is tell our partner as much information as they need to make the right choice and no more. You don't want to give them all this extra information because as soon as the lead goes down and dummy hits, your partner is out of the game. It, it's not relevant what information you've given them anymore. You want to give them the minimum amount of information to allow them to actually choose the right spot. So I think this is really important because most people when thinking about bidding is I need to tell my partner this or I need to tell my partner this about my hand. Whereas why? What you want to think about is, is this information going to help my partner's decision? Will they be able to decide better about what contract they want to play if you give them this information? And does it make any difference? If it doesn't make any difference, then we don't want to actually tell them. We want to tell them the minimum amount of information to get them to the right spot. Any more is just useful information for the opponents. So in the bidding, don't focus on I must tell my partner this or I must tell my partner this. Is You want to work out where do I potentially want to go? What are the options that I might want to get to? And of my bids, which of them will help my partner choose the appropriate spot? And this is another important way to think about um, bidding to work out how far, like what bids you should actually choose and what bids are irrelevant and a waste of information that just help the opponents. So an important idea or concept about bidding where you don't actually want to tell your partner absolutely everything about your hand um, because as soon as uh, the bidding's over, one of you's out of the game, and that information is just going to help your opponents. Next, I wanted to talk a bit about overcalling and what are our objectives in overcalling. So, there are sort of five main objectives that we want to talk about uh, when overcalling, which is the, the things that we're trying to do when we make an overcall. So let's say that the opponents open a club and we've got this hand. Do you overcall a spade? Why, why not? Some people will say, well, I don't have eight points, so I don't overcall. And this is going back to, you have this rule set where you think you have to follow these rules to do it. But you want to go back and think, what are your objectives in bridge? Your objectives are to get a good score. Okay, so how are you going to get a good score? These, these rules that people blindly follow are there to most of the time get you a good score without thinking. But what you're actually trying to achieve when you're overcalling, there is a bunch of them, but some of them's lead direction. You want to tell your partner what you want them to lead. So if your partner, like leading is one of the toughest things in bridge. And there is so much error in it. And if you can tell your partner what to lead, this is a huge, like a fantastic way to minimize these errors that you actually get. So asking for a good lead is very important. So when you overcall, you're telling your partner, how about leading this suit? Another thing that you might be interested in is competing. So like the points might be relatively evenly split and you want to either push the opponents up one level or buy the contract. So by getting into the auction and telling your partner where you've got some of the suit, you might be able to push the opponents up or buy, um, buy the contract. So you might even be happy going down one because they might be cold for plus 110 by making say two hearts and you might go one down in two spades for minus 50. And that's still good because you've improved your score even though it's negative. Um, another 
reason that you might choose to overcall is disruption. The opponents might want to choose, like they, they want to be able to find out information and work out how high to go. But if you take away bidding space, they've got less options about how to describe their hand. And in which case, they might not be able to find the premium spot. And if they don't find the right spot, then you've improved your score. So if you can take away space in such a way that the opponents then can't solve uh, the way that they want to bid these hands, you, you've disrupted their auction and you've done a good job and improved your score. Another one is that maybe you want to have a sacrifice. So what this is is kind of like competing, but usually where you know you're going to get doubled because it's the opponent's hand and they might be cold for four hearts and you want to play four spades doubled. Again, similar concept to competing, but this time it's their hand and you're just trying to get a smaller negative. And the final one is it's your hand and you should be playing the contract, so you may as well tell your partner what your best suit is. So all of these objectives have different criteria. So if it's your hand, you likely want some points. You want eight or more points, usually, um, because otherwise your hand's too weak and it's probably not going to be your hand. But let's look at some of the other ones. Lead direction. You want good honours in your suit. You want good quality suit uh, for this to this lead to happen. Uh, what about competing? Well, it's it's easier to compete in spades than it is in hearts, than it is in diamonds, than it is in clubs. And the reason being is, if we're competing in spades and the opponents find a diamond fit, we can bid at the two level. Whereas if we had a club fit, we would have to bid at the three level. So spades is really important here because it doesn't matter what suit the opponents are trying to play in, we can always compete at the same level that they are. So having the boss suit is really valuable here. Another one is disruption. And this think about this in terms of how much space we've actually taken away from the opponents. Um, here, if I bid a spade, we've taken away one diamond and one heart from the opponents but we have given them a double available, and we have allowed the opening bidder to have another bid without their partner responding. So we've made pass more flexible. But we've taken away a little bit of space. Um, and then sacrificing, again, sacrificing very similar. You want the higher ranking suit because then it's cheaper to sacrifice usually, so spades is good for that. And then finally, your hand, you want some sort of points. So. Would you overcall on this hand? For me, definitely. Lead direction is such a vital thing. I've got a good suit that I want my partner to lead, so that's a big tick. Disruption, I am taking away a bit of space from the opponents. What about uh, competing? It's good, we've got the boss suit. It's much more valuable than any of the lower ranking suits. And sacrificing, it's good as well. The only one it's not great for is your hand, is like, is it our hand? Are we the ones that should be playing this contract? I don't have that many points, but for all the other reasons, this is definitely worth a one spade overcall. Right. But what about if the opponents instead opened a club? Instead of opening a club, opened a heart. What about now? Well, let's think about all these again. Lead direction. Well, it's still, like, I still want a spade lead. But the opponents are probably playing in hearts because people really angle for playing in majors. So now I'm the one that's going to be on lead, so it's less likely that my partner will be the one that might be able to lead. Um, but it doesn't mean that they can't. Still, I've found a good suit to lead, but it's most likely me that's going to be on lead. So lead direction drops down a bit, but still, still reasonable. What about competing? Fantastic still. Spades over hearts, still good. What about disruption? Not so good anymore. We don't take away any space because we take away their one spade bid, but they weren't going to utilize that anyway. And we've now opened up an extra bit of double for them. So we've actually not disrupted their auction yet. But one of the things is sometimes uh, your partner might be able to disrupt them. Your partner can raise the suit as well. So it's not just your bid that can disrupt them, but you're allowing your partner in to uh, actually make really disruptive bids. So disruption's a lot lower, but it's not negligible because it opens up your partner being able to bid as well. And then finally, your hand. Uh, we don't have a particularly good hand, so it's not great on that 
point of view, but our suit's good, so it's not, not terrible. I again would still bid a spade on this hand because um, it's a good suit, happy for partner to lead. They might end up in no trumps, they might not end up in hearts, they might play a minor. So there's still that value. Disruption, it allows partner to come in and possibly disrupt their auction more. And also uh, competing, it's fantastic to be able to get the spade suit in. I would still bid a spade here, but hopefully you can see that this isn't as good. So um, you want to work out um, where you draw the line on what sort of suit quality or things like that, but understanding what you're trying to achieve and how your bids actually achieve them are quite valuable because you can see that bidding a spade here isn't as good as if your opponents had opened a club. Okay. What now if we have the same suit and the opponents open a club? Alright, so we can still get in and bid a diamond and it's good for lead direction, which that's good, but it's bad for all the other reasons. It's not good for competing uh, because the opponents probably have the majors and we have diamonds, which makes it harder to compete because if they find two of a major, we then have to bid to the three level. It doesn't take away space uh, unless partner jump raises them. It in fact gives them a way to show both majors in one bid because if I bid a diamond, they can then double to say I have both hearts and spades. So it's got negative disruption um, currently. Um, so here, I might not overcall a diamond because it doesn't do so much. But what I personally would do, and this is just my, uh, what I like to do, it's not like a common thing, is I would bid two diamonds. Okay, so I don't actually have six diamonds here, but when you're thinking about what you're trying to achieve, I want to disrupt them. This has taken away space. I want a diamond lead. This will get the diamond lead. Competing. We might overcompete, but I've at least put the pressure on the opponents. And coming in and bidding at the two level for the opponents over two diamonds is a lot tougher than responding at the one level. So the disruption factor of this is so much higher that I would personally would choose two diamonds instead of one instead of one diamond. But that's just my uh, preference on these sorts of hands. Um, and I'm telling my partner I got a six card diamond suit, but is that such a bad thing? When are they going to make the wrong choice because of that? Is maybe they want to choose to sacrifice. And I don't have quite as much distribution as they expect. So I've lied a little bit there, but I think that's a low frequency thing because we're not a uh, favorable vulnerability. Um, so partner is less likely to do it. And if they are going to do it, they're going to make that bid nice and quickly, which will up the uh, uh, disruption factor, and the opponents might choose wrong as well. So here, my preference would be two diamonds on this hand rather than one diamond, because going back to those factors of what you're trying to achieve, this also has the benefit of telling my partner I don't have a good hand. So the is it your hand concept, I've told my partner I don't have it, so... Don't try and bid game expecting me to have a good hand here. So I think two diamonds is actually quite a valuable uh, choice here. Uh, so that was a bit about overcalling. Um, there are other f spots where thinking about uh, the bidding and what you're trying to achieve is really valuable. And this includes like preempting and also like third seed openings. Um, so I'll just briefly touch on them, but not show any hands about them. So when preempting, this is a lot about risk versus reward. Your reward for preempting is disrupting the opponents and then making the wrong choice, which may include your partner making a penalty double. So, thinking about when can partner do this. If if you're in third seat and has gone pass pass and you preempt, say two diamonds or something, and the opponents step out and bid three clubs, the chance that your partner has a penalty double is actually pretty remote. So when you're preempting in third position, the chance that your partner has a penalty double is actually reduced. So your reward for preempting in third position is actually reduced because your partner can't penalize them as often. Uh, you still disrupt their auction. Um, they don't have that great space, but your reward drops down but your risk is still there. So preempting in third position isn't as great um, because you don't have as good a reward, except for the fact that the opponents might get to the wrong spot. 
In second position, your reward isn't as good as well. Um, because let's think about how many people can have really strong hands. Your right hand opponent has passed, so they don't have a strong hand. So now there's only two people that can have good hands, and one of them is your partner. And when you preempt, you've taken away space from your partner, and they don't know, like, it's harder for them to judge a lot of the time. So when your partner's got a strong hand, it can make it a bit awkward, but not as awkward for the opponents. So preempting's still good, but not as good as in first position. And preempting in the first position is really valuable because you've got two potential strong opponents and only your partner that can have a strong hand. So instead of it being 50-50, you're now two to one odds that you're going to uh, annoy the opponents with your preempt here. So just a little bit about positioning with risk versus reward. Another very important thing about preempting that doesn't get taught enough early on is vulnerability because vulnerability matters so much uh, because we're all, preempts all about risk versus reward. We're trying to disrupt the opponents and we might be giving them a chance to penalize us. Hopefully not, but sometimes they do. Now, if we're vulnerable against not, they're going to try to penalize us more, so we want to be more conservative. Whereas if we're not vulnerable against vulnerable, they don't get so much reward for penalizing us, and they get a good reward for bidding game. So we want to be more aggressive with preempting. So you should be more free and open to preempt, or potentially preempt at higher levels when you're not vulnerable against vulnerable. Um, whereas hold back a lot when you are actually vulnerable. And finally, I want to talk about opening in third seat, because this is a bit of an interesting issue about do you open on weaker hands? So one of the things is when your partners pass, is you know that they can't get too excited in the bidding. So you might be able to open a little bit light, because your partner probably can't bid game a lot of the time. So if you think about it in terms of risk versus reward, opening a little bit light in third position can be good, because the risk is pretty low of your partner getting excited. So what I would do with third seat openings is again think about risk versus reward, but also think of it in terms of overcalling. Okay, you've got lots of the same objectives uh, if you're in third position as if you're overcalled. Do you want a certain suit led? And what I'm talking about here is if you're just a little bit light for opening, like eight to twelve point, eight to eleven points, do we open these hands? And what I like to think about in those cases is, uh, do we want a certain suit led? Are we going to be able to compete in this suit? Can we disrupt the opponents? And opening can disrupt the opponents in multiple ways, because if you get to open the bidding, then you put the opponents on the back foot. Most people have really good systems of supporting their partner and finding out exactly what they've got if they get to open their own suit and potentially raise it. But you have less structure, less system, if you're the overcalling side, and it's a lot tougher. So if you open in third position, you put the opponents on the back foot, and they might not be able to untangle it. Even if your bid didn't take away that much space, it makes it pretty awkward for them. And this is why lots of expert players open a little bit light in third. And it's got these factors of, I want this suit led, or I want to disrupt the opponents, and this is how it actually achieves this. So um, hopefully I've covered a fair bit about the objectives and bridge and certain different situations, what you're trying to do. So hopefully you enjoyed this featured lesson, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.